Mark Eaton. Um, I'm a freelance ornithologist, uh, amongst other things. I'm secretary of the Rare Breeding Birds Panel and chairman of the European Bird Census Council. Uh, and until late last year, I was um, principal conservation scientist in monitoring science at the RSBB Centre for Conservation Science. And what I'm going to talk to you about now is some work I did uh, shortly before I left the, the RSBB as part of a, a long career involved in, in the monitoring of the UK's bird populations. Birds of conservation concern five, so the fifth assessment of the UK's regularly occurring species published in December 2021. So I'm going to talk through about birds of conservation concern, explain what these assessments are, why they're important, and then talk about the results of this latest fifth such assessment. So birds of conservation concern assessments are objective data-led reviews of how all of the UK's regularly occurring bird species are doing their stock takes if you like. So assessing species by species, reporting on what species are doing well, are winners, what species are doing poorly. And by doing so, we get an overview of how all of our birds are doing. It allows the, the UK's conservation community to assess the impact of its conservation efforts and whether they're working. It provides a a handy and easy way of communicating how our, our birds are doing and probably most importantly in a, a situation as I'm sure you appreciate um, we don't have the resources the funding the ability to do all the conservation we want to do in the UK you know, everywhere all the time on all species um, so we have to prioritize and one of the best ways and simplest ways of doing that is identifying which species most need conservation help. So it allows prioritization to, allow, to enable the most efficient use of resources. And what Birds of Conservation Concern does is use, take a huge amount of quite complicated information from monitoring programs and the like, synthesize that, simplify all that information to a really quite easy to understand output, a traffic like system whereby those species of lowest concern, those species which we don't have any, any worries about in the UK, go onto the green list. Those species for which there are, there's some great concern, some reason to, uh, to keep an eye on them, go onto the amber list. And finally, those species of greater conservation concern, our greatest worry that really need our help, such as the turtle dove in this slide, go onto the red list, highest concern. So I'll give you a short history of, of red listing in the UK. And the first attempt to do this was back in, in 1990, where Leo Batten and, and co-authors produced what was called a, a red data list at that time. So it wasn't birds of conservation concerns we know now. It wasn't a red, amber and green process, but it produced a red list of 117 species. So quite a long list, putting nearly half of the UK species um, on the red list, which was published in this, this book back then. But by 96, there had been a new process developed, this birds of conservation concern process. And the first assessment was back then. First red, amber and green, green list and placed 36 species on that first red list. The thing that, that really caused attention back then was the number of farmland birds, skylarks and corn buntings and a whole range of farmland species that were on the red list. And it really raised the profile of declining farmland birds. 
The second bird conservation concern was six years later. The red list rose, 36 to 40 species, with a number of woodland species came, coming on, as well as continued listing of farmland birds. So things like lesser spotted woodpecker and willow tits, woodland birds, went onto the red list, brought to attention that the decline of concerns about our woodland birds. But good news, as these assessments have shown, so the recovery of raptor species such as red kite, osprey, saw them moving off the red list. So the first species after that first assessment, by the second assessment, some species were already moving off onto the amber list. So conservation successes. The third red list was published in 2009. The third birds of conservation concern. This is the first one I was involved in. Saw quite a jump in the red list. So from 40 before up to 52 species. More woodland species such as hawfinch and, and wood warbler, or wood warbler and quite a few others are Afro-Paleartic migrants, so cuckoo for example, going onto the red list. So that was the, the, the news story around that third assessment, concern about those migrant species. Also looking further, looking to the north rather than species that go south, more northerly species like Wimbro and Rebbe moved on to, to the red list and we're beginning to see signs of a climate change impact upon the threatened species in the UK. But again, some successes. Stone curly and woodlark, for example, moving off the red list onto amber as a direct consequence of conservation work. The previous one before the, the new one I'm going to talk about was in, in 2015. So the fourth assessment, another jump. The red list rose to 67 species. I'm thinking we would be talking 36 species in the first list. We're already at 30, 67 by 2015. Upland species such as dotterel and curlew moving onto the red list. Real concern for, for curlew given both the declines and the importance of the UK's population of curlew. Seabirds, something important for us in, in the northeast. Concern growing for seabirds, kittiwake, puffin, and shag moving onto the red list. And we saw for the first time for a while, we saw more species moving onto what we call the list of former breeders, basically extinct species. Uh, a couple, Timixin and Serum, were never common, always been rare species in the UK, but Rhinec was the first once widespread, quite common and widespread species to be lost from the UK for over 200 years. Uh, Rhinecs were once so, so widespread that the RSPB would sell nest boxes for them. You can find adverts in RSPB magazines from 1912 for, for Rhinec nest boxes, now extinct. But again, on the flip side, and only you know, small news, good stories compared to all the bad news, but there's still conservation successes with Bitten and Nightjar, the recipients of conservation effort over, over previous decades, moving from red to amber. And here we can see the, the pattern of change over those, those four red lists from one through to, to four, we can see at the bottom, both the, that little black band, which is the, the, the extinct species, if you like, the former breeders, that growing slightly, but that substantial increase in the red list from 36 to 67 over just four assessments. Uh, a slight contraction in the amber list at the, uh, at the fourth assessment, which, you know, good to see that, that, red, that green list grow, but still overall not a happy picture. So, Birds Conservation 5, that's the assessment that's just been, been published last, at the end of last year and I'm going to talk about. An assessment driven and done by a, a panel of, of 10 scientists, ornithologists, uh, which I, I led in my RSBB role, drawn from NGOs, so from the RSBB, from the British Trust for Ornithology and the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, uh, and five government agencies, that's the, the four national agencies and the JNCC, which are the um, sort of overarching body at a UK level. Also endorsement from a wide range of other conservation uh, and recording organisations behind it, but most importantly, data from literally thousands of observers. There's a huge, uh, huge body of enthusiasts in the UK. We're very lucky to be able to call on the efforts of many, many volunteers who go out recording birds, submitting birds, taking parts in organised surveys such as the, uh, the BTO led Breeding Bird Survey, which give us really good quality data to make these sorts of assessments. So, if you don't want to listen any any more to me talking, you can go and go and look this paper up online. So there you are. If you Google or if you copy down that URL, you can find it open access. Uh, it was published in the journal British Birds 
in December, but it is available open access online. There is also a summary document with the, the highlights from it. It was This work was led um, by one of my RSPB colleagues who wrote the paper, Andy Stanbury. So you can find all that detail online. You don't really need to, to listen to me any anymore. But if you do want to know more from me, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So like I say, Birds Conservation Concern Assessments use the latest and the best monitoring and survey data we have. So all that information uh, we have from annual efforts are recording our birds. And then assess each species by well-defined criteria, rules that we, we try and maintain, use in the same way between assessments so they're comparable. And these rules are, are robust. Uh, it's a scientific process. It, uh, this time round, we applied the, the UK government's um, statistics code to make sure that they were, they were as rigorous as possible and would be accepted uh, as robust assessments. And here's just a list of the sources of, of data. So information on our, our breeding bird population. So for, for widespread, common and widespread species, data from the Breeding Bird Survey I mentioned before, and also the Common Bird Census, which ran before it, meaning that for many species, we can track changes in their populations back to the late 1960s. Data from seabird censuses, and the SMP is the, the annual program, seabird monitoring program of, of colony monitoring. WEBS is the Wetland Bird Survey. Sorry, there's a lot of acronyms on this slide. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, the Wetland Bird Survey, again, another BTO-led partnership program, which monitors the uh, mainly the wintering populations of water birds. And the UK has very important populations of, of wildfowl and waders. We get trends in those from the, the monthly accounts done by volunteers in WEBS. The Rare Breeding Bird Panel, that's what I, my, my day job, um, monitors the populations, as the name suggests, of our rarest breeding, breeding birds. So about 80 species of our, our rarest breeders are, are monitored annually by the RBP. SCARABS is a horrible acronym, Statutory Conservation Agency and RSBB Annual Breeding Bird Scheme, um, is periodic surveys of scarce breeding and conservation priority species, so hen harrier surveys, uh, capercaillie surveys, corncrake surveys and so forth that are done every few years to give periodic updates. We use bird atlases, uh, so the BTOs, uh, Breeding and wintering bird atlases, the most recent of which was between 2007 and 11, to give us idea of bird range, because that's part of the, the assessment. APEP is the work of the Avian Population Estimates Panel, so estimates of population sizes in the UK. ERLOB is the European Red List of Birds, because we use international assessments uh, as part of our UK assessments. And the IUCN refers to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, uh, Nature's uh, assessments of global risk of extinction, so global red list, red list status. So we use all these, this information, crunch it down into our, our criteria, feed it through our, our criteria. Basically, we have a suite of red list criteria. And if a species qualifies against any of these, just one of them, automatically goes on to the red list. If it doesn't, and you'll see on the next slide, we then assess species against the amber list criteria. If it meets any of those, they go on to the amber list. If they meet none of those, they go on to the green list, like the blue tick you saw before. So any species that is globally threatened, that has shown a severe decline historically, that's an assessment going back to, to, the, uh, to 1800. Uh, if it's shown a severe population decline in the breeding season, so the breeding population has gone down by over 50%, or the non-breeding population, or similarly, if the range, the distribution where a bird is found, if that has gone down by over 50% or either in the breeding season or the winter, all of these criteria, if you meet any of those, a species is red listed. So we're talking about large loss of population, large decline in the UK, either in recently over the last 25 years or back to a period uh, in the late 60s or if they've declined massively historically, so they were once a much more common and widespread species, or if they are threatened globally. If a species is threatened with extinction on a global scale, we believe this should automatically be on our red list. So a species meets any of those, it's red listed. The AMBA criteria, I won't go through in so much detail. Uh, there's a, it's a longer list, 
but if a species is not red listed, but maybe it is declining in one of those metrics of population or range, but moderately. So less than 50%, but more than 25%. We call that a moderate decline. In either population or range, it is amber listed. If it is red listed, believed to be threatened with extinction in Europe, not globally, but in Europe, we amber listed. It is as if it has shown that historical decline I referred to before, but has begun to recover from that, again, on the amber list. And then species that are, are rare, so for example, that's less than 300 breeding pairs in the UK, they're localised, so they're present, a large proportion of the population is present at just a few sites, again, amber listed. We believe that gives them a, a vulnerability to, to the loss of those sites, so onto the amber list. And lastly, a criteria which doesn't really reflect threat in the UK, but if a species has an internationally important population that's in the UK, we believe we should amber list it. Even if that population is healthy and doing well within the UK, our responsibility to look after that internationally important population means we put it onto the amber list as sort of watching brief. OK, enough about criteria. Like I say, if you don't meet any of those, a species goes onto the red list. So some results. 245 species were identified as being regularly occurring. So this is not rarities, vagrants that only occur a few times a year. This is species that either breed regularly in the UK or they occur repeatedly in sort of expected wintering populations. Um, so 245 species were assessed. Must say that because of the impacts of the, the COVID lockdown on the last year of fieldwork planned for the the SEBA census that's been going on. There's been uh, one of these periodic all Britain and Ireland SIBO censuses with a massive effort made to go and count all our SIBO populations over the last few years and provide an update from last time that was done around the turn of the century. That was supposed to have been finished in time for this assessment to have been done, but because of COVID uh, and fieldwork un being unable to happen in 2020, the results have been delayed. So for our seabirds, we decided we wouldn't reassess them. Um, we needed that really good new data to be able to see what their new status is. So for the time being, with the exception of one species, leeches petrol, which has been surveyed, we, we've just kept the assessments the same as, as before. There will be an update on how our seabirds are doing and new birds conservation concern assessments for them within about a year from now, once we get the, the data through. So 245 species. 70 species on the red list. So if you can remember from before, it was 67 um, at the last assessment, that's gone up to, to 70. The amber list rose as well from 96 to 203. The green list dropped correspondingly from, from 81 to 72. So again, not fantastic news. For the, the fourth time in a row, the red list has gone up from the previous assessment. We've risen from 36 in the first to nearly, very nearly double that 70. Um, what's that? Uh, 96 to 22, yeah, so 25 years later. So nearly a doubling in that 25 years. And here we can see it like before, the same graph, but just with a, an extra assessment added on and we can see that small growth in the red list since the last assessment. So this is not, not good news, and you may be quite familiar when you see and hear people like me coming to, to talk about how our bird populations, and in fact, other taxonomic groups are, are doing. You know, it fits in with the pattern that we've seen over a number of decades now of biodiversity loss and increased worsening status of, of our species, in this case, birds. So sorry, not, not good news. So here we have the, the complete list, the red list of 70, 70 species. And if you want, you can freeze this, this talk here uh, and, and read through there. Um, or of course, you can go online, uh, Google it, find the, the information online after the talk if you'd rather. Um, so a great range of species. Yeah, that's 70 species, that's, that's a lot. Um, you'll notice uh, all sorts on there. Particularly, you'll notice the range, I think, from, from the rare and obscure to through to species which are really quite common, widespread and familiar, but still of, of conservation concern. So the likes of, of starling and, and house sparrow, for example. So I'll talk through 
some of the news on this list, some of the good news, what there is, uh, but but also of course more more bad news. Starting with with one species and additional species moving on to the former breeders list. So golden oriole, not now recorded breeding in the UK since 2009 when the last pair bred um, at the RSPB reserve at Lake and Heath in, in Suffolk. They were never a, a common species in the UK, but in the, say the 1980s, there was a population established up to about 40 pairs a year, breeding largely in the fens, in popular plantations in the fens in uh, Norfolk and Suffolk, some in, some in Cambridgeshire. So an established population which then started to decline uh, through the 90s and really into uh, to this century, really struggling and with that last pair disappearing in 2009. Not particularly clear what what drivers influence this this increase and then, then decline, but it is a species that uh, has now gone. Of course, with uh, with what we see with populations moving north in Europe of many species due to the impacts of climate change, there is the chance that our, our golden orioles might return at some point, although there is evidence of, of declines in the population in parts of Europe, which might prevent that from happening anyway. And then on to some of the, the newly red listed species. So a couple of species moved directly from, from green to the red list, which is quite unusual. Uh, normally, you know, species just do that one step from amber to, to red. Ptarmigan made the jump all the way, largely because until till now, we didn't have any particularly good data on how ptarmigan are doing. And, and it's still true that we don't have robust monitoring surveying of ptarmigan in the UK and that's something that we, we need to address. But what we did have is this new analysis of, of trends in ptarmigan based somewhat unsatisfactorily as a conservationist on, on gay bag data. So this is based on, on numbers of ptarmigan shot. Trying to, to correct, and this is produced by the Game and, uh, Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, uh, analysis of data provided to them, trying to correct for for variation in, in hunting effort to provide this measure. It probably isn't the best and most accurate measure of how ptarmigan are doing, but it displays a very strong, suggests a very strong decline in ptarmigan numbers, and we found this convincing enough to merit the red listing of this species. So another species joining this, this list of, of upland species, and particularly in the case of ptarmigan, a very upland species, a montane species, that seem to be, to be struggling. Uh, and of course, when, when we hear of that, we, we automatically, not necessarily correctly, but we automatically can, are concerned about the impacts of climate change on those, those alpine birds, if you like. The other species to jump straight from green to red, for a very different reason, is, is greenfinch. So one of these common and familiar species which have undergone rapid declines. And here we can see the, the trend in the breeding population of greenfinch using data from the common bird census from 69 onwards and then uh, moving to data from the, the breeding bird survey from 1994. And we can see how greenfinches were doing, uh, doing pretty well. In fact, until 2005 and then the dramatic decline since then, an ongoing decline since then. And we know this was driven by the, the arrival, the, the, the hopping of the disease trichomonosis, um, probably from, from pigeon populations, dove populations, into finches, into green finches and more latterly chaffinches, uh, and driving this, this rapid decline. Um, and this is one of the reasons that you should practice really good hygiene around feeding your, your garden birds. So looking out for signs of disease, but making sure that your, your feeders are kept clean, cleaned regularly to try and prevent the or lower the risk of transmission between between birds um, and hopefully at some point we will see a turnaround and recovery in, in greenfinches. Two species two species I've grouped together here because of the similarities that have moved onto the red list together swift and house martin there's been concern for these species for for years particularly swift because of their, their declines, and they've now both reached the point where they move on to, to the red list. So two species which are both migrants going to sub-Saharan Africa. They're both urban species breeding in, uh, in our buildings around us. Um, and they're also species that, that feed on aerial insects. So some common commonality between the, the 
the two of them and possibly some common drivers in their declines. You can see here the steady decline in, in SWIFTs and still much needed to be done to, to help our SWIFTs and to understand what's really driving that decline. Here we can see a slightly, slightly more variation in, in house marketing numbers being monitored for a, for a longer time, but still a decline in excess of 50%, which is the, the decline by more than 50%, which has triggered the red listing for both species. I mentioned before how uh, seabirds hadn't been reassessed through the lack of data, but the one species we were able to, to assess was leeches storm petrel. Uh, and there has been uh, a substantial, a massive decline in leeches petrel population, a difficult to survey species, but there has been a complete census of the, the breeding population on St Kilda, way off in the Atlantic, of Scotland, where the vast majority of the UK's storm petrels breed. And that found a 68% decline in, in numbers between the last census in 2000 and 2019. So a dramatic decline. There have been signs of these sorts of declines elsewhere in the range as well. So great concern for, for Lucci's storm petrels. Um, I like this photo here because it's a remarkable image of a, of a Merlin hunting Lucci's storm petrels. The concern in the UK is actually not so much Merlin. This photo was taken in North America, by the way, but um, is more predation from great skewers, may, which may be at least one of the, the reasons driving the decline in Lucci's petrels. Another two species I've grouped together joining the red list for the, the first time. Um, purple sandpiper and Montague's carriers. Not a lot in, in common between those two species, other than they are extremely rare breeders. And they always have been rare breeders in the UK, but populations have dropped in recent years. So they are really just hanging on as breeding species. In the last year for which the rare breeding bird panel reported 2019, there was only one pair of, of each. The, uh, the pair of Montague's harriers down in the, the south of Britain, where they, they breed in downland and on salt marshes and in farmland, but in declining numbers, so there's only been one pair recently. Purple sandpipers are, are completely different, um, although we might see them in the along our coast in Northumberland in the winter. In the summer, there is a, a tiny population found in in sort of the high tundra-like habitats in, in northern Scotland, um, but again, only one pair left now. So both because of those declines, but because they're just hanging on as breeding species, moved on to the red list. And another pattern, we see an increasing number of our wintry water birds moving onto the red list. And in this review, Buick Swan, Golden Eye Smew and Dunlin moved onto the red list due to the declines in their wintering populations. This is largely due to shifts in, in wintering ranges. So we're seeing redistributions of wintering birds that come to the UK in the winter from, from northern climes, either coming from the sort of Iceland, Greenland, uh, even from Canada, or, or large numbers of species coming and, and individuals coming from Scandinavia and, and Arctic Russia coming down to escape the harsher winter weathers. And, and of course, we, we see that across the, along the Northumberland coast in, in great numbers at places like Lindisfarne. With climate change, with moving to a, a trend of milder winters, what we're seeing is redistribution of these species with many individuals not migrating so far. So fewer birds migrating to winter in, to, in the UK. And as a result of that, we're seeing these declines. For many of these species, it might not be an overall decline in their population. It's just the birds aren't coming here. They're elsewhere in, in Europe. So it's this, this redistribution, it's often called short stopping. Species are stopping short of where they used to, they're staying in Europe. But for some species, there are indications that it's not that, that there is a, a wider decline in the population. A Buick swan is one such species. Yes, they're declining in the UK, but they may decline, be declining across the flyway as a whole. So it's a bigger issue, a bigger concern. But there's some better news because I've named quite, you'll have noticed the red list increased by three. I've listed quite a few species that have moved on to the red list. The reason it's only increased by three is because some species moved off. Uh, and here are our five species that were red listed previously that have been moved off to the amber list this time round. So song thrush, red wing, pie fly catcher, black red start, grey wagtail. In all of these cases though, having given you a little bit of bad news, I'm going to sort of temper it and, and sort of water it down a bit. 
these species are still showing declines, uh, which are very near red listing level. They're showing near severe declines. It's just that recent fluctuations um, have meant that their, their overall decline has dropped below 50%, in some cases to 49%, so only just amber listed. So yes, it's good news, but it doesn't represent a, a massive recovery. Five flycatcher being one of, one of those species, and there's an example of how we can see um, the breeding trend since 1994 from the, the Breeding Bird Survey. Uh, and that red line on the graph represents us measuring change over over that period, over 25 years of that, for birds of conservation concern, and how that that red line is is now now just above a 50% decline, because of that slight increase in numbers we've seen since um, about 2005, six, seven. So, not a huge recovery. They've not come up back up to the numbers we saw before, but enough that by our rules, by our strict assessment, they moved on to the amber list. But there are there are bits of news, like I mentioned before, I mentioned bittern and marsh area and red kite as examples of species moving off the, the red list. Uh, and our, our success and our main reason to celebrate in this review is the move of white-tailed eagle. So this is a species that was extinct in the UK, that was brought back by reintroduction programmes in West Scotland starting in the um, the 1970s through to successful breeding in the 80s and then a steadily increasing population since. So as a consequence of that, that increase to a population that um, the uh, last year we had data for for the assessment 2019, there were at least 120 pairs breeding in Scotland. But in fact, we know that, that there are probably considerably more. There's now too many white-tailed eagles that they get all get found every every year so the population may be somewhere around 150 pairs and still growing. New more recent introductions in, in East Scotland are contributing to that and hopefully the reintroductions in in England, the release in the Isle of Wight, will help the species more if they're allowed to, um, to prosper undisturbed which we know is a problem but still conservation success and something to, to celebrate. And then there are a lot of species which are still on the red list, haven't changed in, in status. And it's worth reflecting on those because a lot needs to change um, in a species status sometimes for it to move onto the amber list or to move one way or another. Uh, and there can be big changes in, in species populations which aren't reflected in a BOC change. BOC, as we say, birds conservation concern, status change. Um, so it's quite a crude, quite a, a, an insensitive tool for measuring change in our bird populations. So here are some species where we see good news. Our roseate terns, our, very, our Northumberland roseate terns, nearly all of them on Coquit Island, are increasing year on year thanks to the conservation efforts there. Redneck phalaropes have shown uh, a substantial upturn in recent years. Corncrakes were seen to be heading towards extinction in the 1990s. Conservation since then has enabled a recovery, although only a partial recovery. And the crane population that's re-established itself in continental Europe in the 1980s, has been augmented by reintroduction programmes in the West Country, is increasing year on year, so a great conservation success. But these species are still red listed. And also going the other way, we see continued declines in some of our already red listed species uh, and once you're red listed you can't get any any worse our turtle doves are, are declining and have been declining at a horrendous rate for many years now and continue to do so but they've been red listed for a while so things can't get any worse until it comes to the the ultimate step which we hope it won't the moving on to the former breeders list same with the other species on that slide we have great concern about our, our capercaillie population and whether that can survive starlings still common and widespread but still declining uh, and our curly population still declining in, in many areas so great concern for these species but in terms of their birds conservation concern status they stay red briefly some changes on the amber list um, not headline news as, as such same as, as things moving on to the red list but growing concern for a range of species these are the ones to watch that they, they might move on to to the red list in time. So red-breasted magansas, 
declining as a as a breeding species we believe but declining as a wintering species as well we have better data on their wintering population and species like uh wheat here as an example white throat uh, sparrowhawk moving on to the the amber list due to moderate declines so they were green they've moved, moved on to amber so species to keep an eye on This just shows it, and you can get this sort of detail in the, in the paper, which I said is, is open access online. But we can break the the red, green, and amber lists down by by taxonomy. So we can see here, for example, that the group doing the most poorly are quite interesting. The group doing the most poorly are our game birds, um, which you know we have a community and we have a a network of those who should be caring for our, our game birds, and um, not all is is going well. So black grouse. Um, Grey partridge, capercaillie, as I mentioned, and now ptarmigan, all, all red listed. Some of our, our buntings doing poorly, and you can go down, you can see the, the breakdown there through to our, our crows, in fact, and that might not be a surprise, these generalist species doing doing well, so, so no red listed members of the cordary family. So just some general general themes that we can we can take away from looking at these lists, what can they tell us about the wider pattern in our birds and indeed in our, our biodiversity more, more generally? So as has been the case since the, the very first Birds of Conservation Concern Assessment, it is bad news for farmland birds. We remain, um, you know, most of our farmland birds are, are red listed. Of the 19 species which are included on the farmland bird indicator, 12 of them are, are red listed and indeed have been for, for many assessments now. So species like the, the corn bunting um, not only red listed, but continuing to struggle and continuing to decline. Turtle dove are most rapidly declining species in the UK, as it is across most of, of Europe indeed. Um, so big concern for how our turtle doves are doing. And here I mentioned the farmland bird indicator. Here is that indicator. So this is a, an average trend um, of 19 species of, of farmland bird produced every, every year. By the RSBB BTO um, for the UK government as one of their indicators of how our biodiversity is doing. As you can see from this, uh, that well known and dramatic loss of on farmland and birds in the 1970s and 80s can be seen in this graph, but also the continuing decline since then. So we are continuing to lose farmland and birds. Uh, so despite knowing a lot about what's driven these declines, despite having identified how we could turn things around. For, for farmland birds in ways that wouldn't harm our agriculture, but would allow us to deliver conservation alongside food production. We're failing to do so because these opportunities haven't been delivered at sufficient volume and at sufficient scale to, to turn things around. Woodland birds, still a, still a concern. A long list of our woodland species, I mentioned lesser spotted woodpecker and willow tip before, nightingale, woodcock as, as pictured here, all examples of struggling woodland birds. Hawfinch being another, I'll pause a second so we can admire what a handsome, handsome bird a hawfinch is. Upland birds. So this is an exciting picture. This is, this is I mentioned before, the one pair of purple sandpipers uh, that breed in the UK. And this indeed is a photo of the offspring with the adult uh, out of focus in the foreground of that that one pair a few years ago. So hanging on at a, at a secret site in in northern Scotland, but only the one pair. Others such as, as Dottrell and the newly red listed ptarmigan, um, curl you were mentioned mentioned before, windchat, um, a variety of upland species. Great concern about yes the impacts of climate, but also the management of our, our upland habitats and the more in, increasingly intensive management of our upland habitats and the impacts that that's having on the birds and other biodiversity. Seabirds, still a concern. Like I say, we're, we're awaiting a proper update on, on seabirds. We're waiting for the, the data from the, the last year of that, that big census so we can assess them. But we know from previous assessments and we're not expecting any change really in the likes of, of shag on the red list, arctic skewer rapidly declining. Uh, species really worried about the threat of extinction for our, our Arctic skewers, for example. And again, this continuing concern about how our migrant species are doing. 
a species which are, are subject to threats and pressures both on their breeding grounds, the same as many of our, our resident species are. There are problems for many of our resident species. Well, the migrants have to face that. They also have to face the difficulties of migration and whatever might happen there. And then changing conditions, either through climate or land management pressures in their wintering grounds. And we particularly see this in those species which go south of the equator to our, our humid tropics. So house martin, one of these species, newly red listed. Cuckoo already on, already on the red list. Big concerns for these. And we can see here, this is our sub Saharan migrants, uh, sorry, Afro Paleoarctic migrants, um, and how they've been placed on the five lists across the, the five assessments. And we can see how the number red listed has grown at each assessment. So, and in fact, now half, so above average, we think that um, we've got a little. What is it somewhere around 30% of all species red listed? But we can see where we just look at these Afro Paleoarctic migrants, half of them are so above average rate of endangerment of threat to our migrant species. And then this issue, as I mentioned before, of our, our wintering water birds changing distributions and how these populations are not coming to the UK at the same scale as before, and we see an increasing number of uh, these species joining the red list. So Dunlin before on that slide, Smew, redistributing its, its wintering range, moving out of the UK, becoming less common here. And again, we can see, uh, and the first assessments, there were no red listed um, wintering water bird species. We saw the first couple added to the red list in the third assessment. We now got eight of these species on. And as I said before, for some of them, it may just be a redistribution. Numbers of the population as a whole haven't declined in Europe, but for others, and we, we know this is the case for, say, Potchard, as well as Buick Swan, Pintail, that this is a, a population level decline, a, a bigger, bigger picture sort of thing. And indeed, that bigger picture is becoming more apparent to what is threatened and our conservation concerns in the UK. So now nine of the species we assess for birds of conservation concern, our, our regularly occurring species, are indeed globally threatened. So they're on the IUCN's red list. This is the same red list that pandas and tigers are on, threatened with extinction everywhere. So we now have nine species on that, leeches, storm petrel, uh, as well as that, that decline in the UK putting it on the red list. The decline um, in other breeding grounds in the uh, at the Atlantic as a, to be globally red listed, so believed to be a global threat of extinction. Kitty Wake was already red listed, but we've highlighted on this this figure here because it is now joined the the global red list as well. So it's not just declining within the UK. The wider pattern indicates there's real concern for it. And then we have a number of water bird species. Turtle dove, I mentioned the decline in turtle dove being across Europe, that's sufficient that it is now listed as vulnerable on the IUCN global red list. Slavonian grebe, another example of one of these species on the red list. So it's it's bad news. It is, I can't pretend that, that this is a cheerful, cheerful story, but it's not all bad news. And I do like to to finish these sort of talks on a, on a slight upward arc so I, I don't leave you all completely depressed. So we do see good news. We see increases. Um, this, you know, this is uh, Avocet's breeding on the Northumberland coast. It's not so many years ago that would have seemed completely un unthinkable. And we're seeing the, the recovery and the increase of many species. Now, some of this is driven by climate change. And of course, we know that in the long term and globally, climate change is one of the biggest threats to, to biodiversity and the environment that, that there is, and it will drive declines and loss of biodiversity. But we are seeing some species prospering because of it. Even things like, like wrens, the, the decreasing frequency of hard winters mean that wren numbers are certainly larger, certainly higher than they ever have been in, in a, you know, the history since we've been recording them, something like 13 million pairs of, of wrens in the UK. So many species are prospering. We're seeing new species breeding in the UK. Colonists such as great white egret, um, black winged stilts, cattle egrets and so forth moving up into the UK. And again, 
although climate change is driving some of the range expansions leading to this, this is also a consequence of improved protection and conservation effort right across the continent. The, the European Union's Wild Birds Directive has done an awful lot to help the populations of species like Great White Eagle, which has expanded from Eastern Europe. It's not moved north from the south, it's expanded from Eastern Europe back across the continent due to, to greater levels of protection and habitat creation and then expanded north into the UK. So it is a conservation success. And of course, those real conservation successes, the ones that we can point to the work that's been done to turn things around from species, in some cases, such as white-tailed eagle, bringing them back from extinction. So now something like 150 pairs of white-tailed eagles, whereas you know, when I was born, there were none. So fantastic news. Bittens and other species. In the in the 1990s, there were about a dozen booming male bittens left in the UK. That population is now over 200 and increasing year on year thanks to to protection and the creation of really good and suitable habitat for bittens to expand into. And red kite, and it's always nice to talk about red kites because of the the cover of that red data book I showed before. So back in 1990, there was no better example of a threatened species than red kite, because that was a species that was really on its, on its uppers. It came close to extinction. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, there were maybe no more than 30 pairs left in the UK in, in Wales. Thanks to protection of that population and to reintroduction projects all over the country, haven't all prospered as well as they, they might have done. For example, locally, the Gateshead reintroduction. Um, and we know why that is, it's due to illegal persecution. But in the whole, a fantastic success story. I was in Oxfordshire a few days ago and the skies are full of them and that's something to be very happy and very proud about. So it's not all bad news. And just finally a, a slide full of photos taken in, in Northumberland of red listed species from from rare visitors such as redneck greaves to, to starlings um, to things passing through like Wimbrel to our resident willow tits, all red listed. Northumberland is very much affected by the changes, by the influences on bird populations I've talked about today. And it is also a very important place for some of these species. And we can do our bit in Northumberland to help these birds. So finally, a few thank yous to, uh, to Andy Stanbury in particular, who, who worked and led this and wrote the paper. The other people in uh, the panel that worked with, with me to, to produce these assessments to all the people who collected data to enable us to do that. And if you're one of those volunteers in a bird survey, bird recording in the UK, thank you very much. If you're not, then have a look into it and see if you can help. Um, British Birds for publishing it and the funders of the assessment. And at that point, I should just leave you with my, my email address, should anyone want to follow uh, this talk up with any questions to me. And I'll thank you for listening.